Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever in the world you are, because it's easy to forget and say just say good evening at the start of the show, but we've got listeners all over the world. It's quite amazing, really, considering it's uh, just me and Jason chatting away on Skype with some Skype guests, and we get people listening all over the world. It is truly amazing, and we do appreciate you guys listening, and especially any feedback you can give us, you know. Anything on guests you'd like to hear, topics you'd like to hear discussed, and anything like that. If you've got any suggestions to uh, put to us, then you're more than welcome to use the contact button on the Autonomous Media website. That's autonomousmedia.net. Or you can email myself or Jason if you if you want to do it privately. And um, that's andy at raconteursnews.com or jason at raconteursnews.com. And uh, we'll see what we can do for you. So we've got a great lineup for you this evening. Um, we've got a great guest this evening. But um, after us at 10 o'clock, not Dr. Tamara and Tina will be here with a happy hour. And it's one that I'm particularly interested in this evening because Tam's going to be sharing her experiences of homeschooling. And I know that's something that uh, a lot of people are looking for, for uh, information about nowadays. It's becoming more and more popular as we go along great stuff if you can keep your little ones out of the state indoctrination system but uh jason good evening jason how are you mate i'm all right mate i've got a bit of um bit of cold so much hit me it's uh as you probably can hear from my voice it's a little bit deeper and more booming um which probably makes me sound a little bit sexier so uh, it's a sexy raconteur's news tonight i think <laughs> If you say so, mate. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we've got a great guest, haven't we? All lined up. It's uh, it's uh, it's going to be a good one. I, I've got a feeling in my bones. We have, yeah. So I suppose um, we, we've got a couple of things we want to want to discuss, but we'll perhaps do them after the break. Uh, let's first introduce our guest tonight. Tonight's guest. Um, He's been putting uh, an awful lot of information out on the uh, internet with his site downloadedcontent.com. Uh, so welcome to Raconteur's News, Daniel Lewis Crumpton, all the way from Georgia. Hey, Andy. Hey, Jason, man. You guys gave us Led Zeppelin, so i got to give something back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, uh, how are you doing, uh, Daniel? Pretty good. Like I said earlier, I'm doing better than I was yesterday. Somebody, I said that today earlier when I went to go pick up my vitamins. They said, "Oh, did you have a bad day yesterday?" I said, "No, I'm just not there." So, you know, any day that you're here is a better day than the day before. <laughs> well, yeah, fair point. Um, so, I mean, when we were talking uh, briefly off air before we started the show and checking the levels and all that, I said, you know, subjective discussion. Please, can we talk about anything but Trump? So, the field is yours, Daniel. Where do you want to go with this one tonight? Well, I think this is, yeah, this is the first time I've been on uh, Across the Pond. Uh, obviously, you know, what people, most people know me uh, for is my novel, Then Came the Flood. Mm. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but uh, that came out on December the 21st, 2012. And um, it came about, well, I, to use the word researcher now, uh, nowadays really means I looked it up on YouTube. <laughs> so you, you got to be cautious when people say they're a researcher. But um, I came up and was, was biblically trained uh, early on in life uh, in the Baptist church, and I just became fascinated with uh, the idea of the, of the worldwide flood. thought it was a fascinating uh, topic to, to really wrap my – I tried to imagine it in my mind. And since I am a writer, I could see things in a very – uh, cinematic type of way, and so I tried to visualize this thing with a worldwide flood, and uh, me being an apologist for the Christian faith back then, now I don't identify myself as a Baptist so much as, as a Gnostic, uh, mm -hmm. I did a lot of research into the science of the possibility of a worldwide flood, and something that really brought me pause was um, I heard several researchers say that the pockmarks uh, that you see on the moon, the Maria, that we believe that that happened uh, over billions of years, but in all actuality, it uh, you know, and I'm not a mathematician, you have to look it up yourself, uh, that all the marks that you see on the moon had to happen within a 30-minute period. And the object striking it had to have come from Earth. 
and now these guys were using it to justify a worldwide flood. So you could take it or you could leave it. But I imagined that, and in my mind, it, a, a story began to unfold. And um, so uh, as I started to dive deeper into why the flood happened, you come across the extra biblical. And, and you know, if you're an organized religion type person, it's a no-no to look outside of the Bible. But I did the I, I committed heresy and started to do that and started to look at uh, the epics of Gilgamesh and of the Book of Enoch specifically. And once I got my hands on the book of Enoch, uh, I said, I don't understand why the Council of Nicaea and organized religion did not include this book. Uh, it, it, if any extra biblical text should be a part of the canon, it should be that. And um, uh, anybody who's read it and they actually read the text of Genesis, you get into this idea that uh, an extraterrestrial, you know, uh, now the the Bible or religion would call them angels. Angels and extraterrestrials, same thing. Angels are not from Earth. Uh-huh. Um, there was an event in our history where something other than humanity intervened uh, in the natural evolution of our species. Mm-hmm. And um, where, when you start to look at things like Roman mythology and Greek mythology with these chimera, with uh, giants, with uh, satyrs, minotaurs, uh, all these types of, quote, mythical creatures, uh, and you look at uh, – you start to compare all the world's faiths, religions, ancient scriptures, and what we know today, it doesn't seem so much like a myth anymore. Uh, it seems like there was definitely some type of an intervention. Uh, oh, well, I was about to give an introduction to your book. Um, tell us what it's called and, and where people can read it. And uh, uh, the, no- the novel's called Then Came the Flood. Right. Um, and you can get that. Well, you could actually go to downloadedcontent.com and the menu at the top. You can go ahead and read the first three chapters for free. Um, and, you know, if that hooks you. Then you can get the the rest of the novel at uh, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, uh, BooksAMillion.com, anywhere where major books are sold. You can you can get the hardback, paperback, and ebook. Yeah, we, we, as somebody who's uh, who's writing a book at the moment. In fact, I'm in the middle of writing two or three books at the moment. But um, it, it, what sort of what sort of journey did you go 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 on? And is it a novel based upon um, um, something that's real, or is it based on a hypothesis? Well, it, it's it's labeled under fiction, and uh, if you if you actually open open the first few pages, it says based upon actual events. And kind of what I wanted to do was, you know, in our in our generation, people have about a ten minute attention span. Thanks to YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Ten minutes, and that's it. Now, I'm a Virgo, so I could sit and watch a two- to three-hour documentary over and over and over again. You know, This type of stuff fascinates me, and I knew that uh, at the time I was in the Orthodox Church, the, the Christian Orthodox Church, that this type of information like the Book of Enoch and the Nag Hammadi Library wasn't getting to, the, to that group of people. And so I said, well, there's got to be a way to get this knowledge, all this research in a, in a – kind of like a sugar pill, so that they would swallow the knowledge but not realize they were getting educated. And I said, the only way to do that is through fiction. i got to take all this stuff and put it in, in – bury it in, in a fictional story that's entertaining, that is you know, kind of an epic along the lines of Lord of the Rings. You know, I've heard it compared to the Lord of the Rings uh, uh, meets uh, Babylon 5. Uh, you know, it's a mixture of, of, of a lot of different genres, and so uh, it it does take on the form of fiction. But there are so many Easter eggs in the novel that if people actually, you know, for example, there it's before the flood, so you know, according to the biblical text, there, there was no oceans. Uh, there was it was basically a supercontinent. And for example, there's an Easter egg, and I never really explain it in the novel. It's there for you to look up if you want to. But I mentioned the name of Albion. You know, the, the land of Albion, mm-hmm. and uh, there, there's an event where the main character Kima, because the story follows uh, a character by the name of Kima, he's a kind of a stoic, uh, very angry man, uh, uh, and you follow you follow the story through his eyes, and uh, there's there's an instance where he is in Albion, and there's an observatory, 
there, a very high technological observatory in the antediluvian days. Um, so we're talking about high technology in a world that is – or a setting that's more biblical than anything. And uh, uh, when you actually get to that part, he uses a sword uh, that was mingled with a, a mineral known as a, a caliburn. And, of course, he, he ends up sticking the sword in the middle of this observatory, and it's there for you to see it. If you don't, you don't, but it explains where Stonehenge and the, the legend of King Arthur and uh, the Excalibur comes from. And the entire novel is littered with little Easter eggs like that, that if somebody if it tugs at somebody's mind, they'll go and look up the word Albion or Caliburn or you know what Stonehenge is and what it kind of does. Um, so it, it does that, but – you don't really – if you're not interested in any of those topics, it's it's a really good read. The novel is just – it's a good story, but those those little seeds of questions hopefully you know, and have get stuck in people's heads so they look outside of any type of orthodoxy that they're being taught. And, and so I figured the best way to do that is through through a fictional story that uh, anybody can could really enjoy just for the sake of it being you know a good time. Um, yeah, so th- th- this, we get a lot in this country of Albions. It's uh, there's a lot of football teams and things that um, that are called Albion. There used to be a, a really popular soap on TV called Albion Market as well. Which so it's, what what are the the roots of the word Albion? From my understanding, and, and of course, I wrote the novel. I started writing it in uh, 2010, or I did res- I did the research in 2010. So I'm having to go far back. But uh, it's the it's the ancient word for for Britain, uh, as far as my research took me, and um, so I wanted to include that there for anybody who who would would identify you know these leg- the Arthurian legends with the area in which Kima is at. Obviously, Kima couldn't go to England because it's before the flood. Um, <clears throat> those land masses weren't distinguishable before the flood, and so I had to give some type of a uh, of a nod to where it would be. After the, the the face of the earth had changed, and so that's why that's in there. Of course, and, and you deal with other lands, you know, where I talk about Phoenicia and where the legend of the phoenix comes from, and Prometheus. And basically, uh, the way that I explain it is that the the main character Kima acts as a needle, weaving himself through the the tapestry of uh, the world's different cultures, religions, and myths, and he tries to tie them all together. So that you you can kind of see the interconnectivity uh, of Greek mythology and Christian mythology and Jewish mythology and Hindu mythology as a whole and how they overlap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's but, quite an element in that. I know in all the faiths in, uh, of, of this overlap, um, and I know faiths are used to uh, divide people, but a lot of the time, oftentimes, it's they're pretty similar anyway. They're all telling the same story. Yeah, um, the, the difference between religion and spirituality is religion uses semantics to build walls of division between us, and spirituality uh, uses semantics to find bridges of, of of connectivity. You know, if I say Krishna and you say Christ, if we're religious, then we're going to war. But if uh, if we're spiritual, then we will see that Krishna and Christ are the same character. It's the same archetype, mm-hmm. and and then we we have a, a common bear, a, a common language that we can speak, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a well, Daniel. Ahead, Andy. Daniel, um, for, for me, I I looked into um, the Bible probably about eleven years old. I read it, um, I read it cover to cover several times. I got quite interested and even thought about a career as a church minister for a little while. But uh, I've moved on since then and I I really haven't delved into religion that much. But I have read uh, in the last couple of years uh, Fingerprints of the Gods by Graham Hancock and also his follow-up 20 years on Magicians of the Gods. And for me, that that was a really interesting insight into that that time of the flood and and what actually happened there for as someone who who got a lot from those books um do do you think your book would give me a different take on it and and would it appeal to someone who's who's interested in those books 
Absolutely, uh, Graham Hancock and Zechariah Sitchin were prime sources for the for the research in my novel. Um, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm one of the guys. I believe what Carl Sagan said that if we're alone in the universe, it's an awful waste of space. <laughs> you know, I don't believe in any type of a god or gods that uh, are so small minded that one planet's going to keep them occupied. Um, you know, so it's just, I mean, and the biggest book on ufology is the Bible. You got cats going to different dimensions, you know, and seeing chariots that they can't explain, but yet you can't find anything about uh, uh, ufology or, or uh, first contacts or anything like that in pulpits. You're not going to find it. So if you like Zechariah Sitchin, if you like uh, people uh, who discuss that type of thing, then, oh, my, my, my novel is. Uh, the, the cherry on top of that cake, you know, it's it's a fun uh, adventure action type thing that incorporates that research into a a bite sized book. Oh, that's so, awesome! I'll, I'll look forward to having a look at that then, Daniel. We we've actually um, got a quite a good attendance in the chat room tonight. I'll just give a shout out for those that are in there. We've got oh, some guy called Andy Young. Don't know who he is. Then we've got Aid. Good evening, Aid. Aid. Put out a brilliant show last night um, with Amanda on the subject of fracking. Uh, there's some awesome information. Anyone who's missed that show, please check it out. It's on the podcast page on Autonomous Media. Then we've got Dave Iron, Dr. Rock, who's on, on Thursday night this week. And we've got Ian Alone, Freeman Jack, good old Jack, who rescued me when the internet went down last night. Thanks for that, fella. And then we've got Joan Keno over there in Spain, and we know Susie will probably be sat at the side of him having a listen. Luby Lou, uh, Tina, who will be broadcasting with Tam at 10 o'clock. And then we've got Mithrin, good old Mithrin, Sturm, and we've got Jesus in the chat room again. And we've also got guests Scribble and SKG, so a great uh, lineup there. But we've got a question from Mithrin, first of all. And he's asking, is the guest aware of Mauro Biglini's, Biglino's work? I'm not. No, the first time I've heard of it, but I'm, I'm interested. If, if they would type out kind of what field it is, uh, I'd be more than happy to comment on it. Oh, I'm, I'm sure he'll, he'll shoot us a message in a minute or two, letting us know what that's about. I'll pass that on, Daniel. Yeah, so... Yeah, we got people uh, in the chat room saying that you're doing the register, so you're you're a little bit of a teacher today, uh, and uh, doing the register for everybody in the chat. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, we we don't hold with registration here because we know what that's all about. We don't want to give up title of anything we own, do we? <laughs> Absolutely not. No. But um, yeah, it's been uh, been quite. Joan, Joan's going to go all rebellious. All oh, right. Oh yeah, yeah. We we need re rebels. Uh, yeah, we, we can deal with rebels. It's people who toe the line. We're not keen on. <laughs> you've got a you've got a podcast, Daniel, as well, haven't you? That uh, that you, that you do. Do you produce? Do you do that live, or do you uh, just record it and put it out there? No. Uh, yeah, I just launched the uh, the downloaded content podcast uh, the fifteenth of, of this month. Uh, no, I, I, I do that myself. I produce that myself, and no offense to you guys or anything, but uh, um, after I, I, I started doing promotion for the novel and going on several different networks, uh, obviously I, I started speaking more than, uh, than about my novel because I was a, a political activist. And over here, you know, you had an explosion with alternative media with Alex Jones, and uh, it, it's kind of <laughs> – I know you guys are familiar with Alex Jones. Uh, and then you had about a million carbon copies of Alex Jones. Yeah. Yep. And and so you had uh, more fear, more fear, more they're coming to kill us. We're doomed. Let's go buy seeds, bury the seeds. Let's go buy ammo, bury the ammo, and let's bury our heads too. And it just uh, put people in a state of fear. So by the time I was offered a, a I had I was offered a time slot for a two hour show. I was working on a website called ZenInTheCar.com, which was uh, my attempt to bring people of different faiths together to insert themselves into the political machine over here. 
Uh, you had we had you know people who were witches. We had atheists. We had uh, myself was a Gnostic. You had Christians. You had people of all different faiths, and we did. We worked together to to insert ourselves into the political system, and um, so I was brought onto a lot of independent networks in the states to speak about my activism until he, and it it was wonderful. You know, uh, when I was offered my own show on a network, I quickly discovered that behind the scenes, uh, it's just as filthy and dirty and biased as the mainstream media. And uh, for me to speak about the things I like to speak about without worrying if another host on the network or the owner of the network or people who fund the network uh, – if, if they didn't like what you said, uh, if, you, if you came off in, in, a, in a sort of way that stepped outside of Alex Jones-type archetypes, you don't last long, and I did not last long. Uh, now I'm, I'm not going to mention the network, and I'm not speaking for everybody, but I'm saying that for me and for the content that I bring people, and, and uh, I, I'm not good for networks. <laughs> so um, they what, asked. What, what, what do you think? Um, what do you think to the? Because these networks, I, I, I used to listen to them myself back about ten years ago. Uh, Alex Jones, Infowars, that sort of thing. Um, what, what what do you think is behind these networks suddenly? I, and uh, I know that we're on a Trump free night, but you know you, the about face that they seem to have done. Alex Jones was all Ron Paul at one point, and then suddenly he's gone all Donald Trump. Do what do you think's behind that? Do you think it's purely financial? No, uh, the first thing is ego. That's the first. Okay. Um, the first thing is ego, and then the second is money. Um, uh, you, you, and, and oh, obviously, you're going to have a little bit of a, a COINTELPRO. You have government agencies. Uh, if you if you hear of a guy who gets on alternative radio here in the states, and, and they're not very talented, they're really rehashing the same material over and over and over again, and they're just inundating their listeners with, uh, you know, Max Egan said one time on on a, one of his podcasts. I'm a huge fan of Max Egan. He's dead on the money about about most of the things I listen to him about. Yeah, yes. we've had him on the show a couple of times, haven't we, Andy? Uh, Max yeah. Egan. Uh, yeah, we 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 yeah. we we like Max Egan as well. He's great, and I'll I'll be interviewing him soon. Uh, I've already kind of made the connection with him, but he's dead right about these guys. They keep their information in a detective novel type way, so the story never ends. Okay. And so you have to tune in the next day. You have to continue, uh, you know, reading their blogs uh, because death and destruction is always right around the corner. Uh, when you when you get people who are carbon copies of Alex because Alex has a monopoly on that thing, um, typically, from my understanding, uh, the, the you have government entities that have a lot of people that get on the internet and pump this guy like a marketing team. And that's how you'll get some of these bigger names on some of these sub networks in America. And uh, you know the, the network that I was on has one of those. And you know it's it's it boggles my mind why that particular person is as big as it has the following that they do because it is nothing but negativity and it's the same rehash material. Uh, but they have a, a huge following, and you have to wonder why. Well, I, th I think it's it's all to do with the psychology and how, how we're conditioned because um, uh, people do get addicted to fear, and yeah. and, and these people are essentially fear porn, uh, <laughs> really, and um, people do get addicted to it. So it's it, it it is easy to see how people get get dragged in. It's just whether you can grow and move yourself away from that. Yeah, and see, that's something that I wanted to do with with, with my podcast. Um, and if, for anybody who wants, you can go to downloadedcontent.com and get it there, or uh, iTunes, Google Play, uh, Stitcher. It, it's going, it's going to be on all those podcasting things. But the whole kind of mission statement, if there is one, is I understand that there are you know pedophile child rings. I understand that there are chemtrails. I understand that you know nine eleven was an inside job. Most of us understand that. Now what? Where do we go from that point of uh, galvanized fear and stagnation in 
uh, evolution on a personal level and evolution as a species. Where do we go? These guys who have been there are not solutions based at all. I mean, you right. may hear a solution here or there. Most of the times, it's it's a product that they sell, <laughs> but they're not giving you solutions to live a better life. And you know, I'm not, look. I'm not one of these happy-go-lucky guys that says you know pretend that there's no weeds in your garden, that there's no problems. I say acknowledge them. Okay, educate people where you can, but at the end of the day, you know, it all begins with the individual, with the man in the mirror or woman in the mirror. You know, you can uh, – we use expressions like pay attention, okay? Like you pay attention. You are paying your energy, your mind, your consciousness, and whatever it is that you're paying your attention to will create your reality you know, around you. And, and I've told people who are so into people like Alex Jones or that type of information, man, you go to try to have coffee with these guys, and they're so nervous of everything. Are you recording me? Who is that car parked out there? I mean – their coffee spilling over, and I told these guys one time I was having coffee with a group of them. I said, listen, guys, for one freaking week, could you post nothing but positive things to your social media? For one week, don't listen to Alex Jones and watch your world and the people that you associate with completely change because – just as much as all this negativity that you hear about, there is more positive things going on in the world, and you're ignoring them. And so you're creating your own reality by what you pay attention to. And so Absol that, ab absolutely. But uh, what I wanted to – the question I wanted to pose to you is that you, before you get to that point and you're in that uh, epiphany, you get that epiphany, um, aren't these – People who um, who are like Alex Jones, like David Icke, um, aren't these a stepping stone towards you actually growing up? And, and so they're necessary um, in order for you to to to, to realize that you know <laughs> you've been manipulated. Even yeah. you, you've gone to look at Alex Jones because you think you're, the, the mainstream media is manipulating you, and then you go to Alex Jones and you're just manipulated in a different way by a different person. 100%. They're absolutely essential. Those guys are alarm clocks. They're alarm clocks, and they need to be there. Uh, so I'm not saying we should get, you know, don't pay attention. I'm saying get the information. Once you feel like there's a repetition going on with the information that you're getting, evolve. Uh, but would I, would I take those guys off the air? No, absolutely not. They're needed. They're absolutely needed. But don't stay there. Don't stay stuck in, in that rut. I mean everybody needs to be uh, shocked into awareness, but continue to become more and more aware. So, yeah, they're, they're essential, and I wouldn't change where they're at. Uh, the thing is, is like they say, you know, he who looks into the darkness eventually becomes the darkness himself. Um, a lot of these guys who are putting out that information uh, – you know, behind the scenes, and, and I know people who've interacted with your bigger names, and, and I'll leave that nameless, but uh, they say that if you're consistently hearing a, a host talk about pedophilia or energetic vampirism or whatever their thing is, a lot, you know, the Bible says that, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. <laughs> so be careful. Yeah, yeah. You know, be careful. But yeah, they're essential. Um, but don't stay there, don't, don't stunt your growth. I would absolutely agree with that. We've actually got an explanation in from Mithrin about Mauro Baglini. He says, but he what Baglino? He was a linguist who was employed by the Vatican to make a literal translation of the Old Testament. They published seventeen of his books, and he was concerned that they were hiding discoveries from the world. So they sacked him. He's now speaking out, and his book is called The Unexpected Bible. Um, I, I might have come across that before, mm -hmm. um, but that that premise of that that particular researcher's work sounds dead on the money. Mm. I mean, you're dead on the money. I mean, thank God uh, we discovered the Nag Hammadi Library, you know, and the Dead Sea Scrolls um, that really opened up the scriptures. And anybody who hasn't uh, taken a look at the Nag Hammadi Library, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Truth, uh, you really need to, especially if you ha if you have an interest in, in the text of the Bible. Um, I, I was always told 
uh, don't read any of those. The devil put those there. You know, uh, it'll take your faith away. Yeah. When I actually first started to read it, it unfolded the scriptures for me like a flower and explained so much of the, the, the deeper uh, hidden meanings of what's in the 66 books. Uh, so sound, I'll, I'll certainly be looking that gentleman up. Um, but there, there's another book that I highly recommend to people who want to study. It's called The Other Bible, um, and it's a collection of the Nag Hammadi Library translated into English. Um, I would highly suggest anybody go and pick that up. I mean the, the, the notion that Christ himself was just as fallible, human, and mischievous as we were as he was coming up uh, is more relatable to me than that he was just sinless. And never got into any trouble. What was the name of that book that you just mentioned? It's called The Other Bible. The Other Bible, because we got uh, Mithrin um, wrote just in the chat that. room that uh, this guy had written something called The Unexpected Bible, so that sounds pretty similar. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I'll look that up for you. Uh, now, I'm not quite uh, – I think uh, the, the Other Bible is a collection of scriptures. So uh, the unexpected Bible might be his speaking on it, but I'll look it up while we talk. Yeah, that's cool, Daniel. Um, we've also got a, a question here from Susie all the way over in Spain. Uh, Ken's kindly posted it for us. And he says, Susie wants to know if the guest believes that the Pleiadians are giving correct information regarding the Anunnaki. Uh, I've heard two different bits of information from from the quote entities called the Pleiadians. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, now, I'm, this is me as a Gnostic, and, and I don't even like really using a term to title myself. I'll say this. I'm not trying to build a church, okay? Yeah. Uh, I'm not trying to convert anybody to my way of thinking. If you hear me say something, that's from my personal experience and from what I, how I interpret it. If it works for you, take it. If a bit of it works, take that. But I ain't trying to build a church. Um, do I believe that we are being contacted by entities outside of our time and space and, and, and whatnot? Yes. Uh, what are they called? I don't know. Are they the Pleiadians? I'm not sure. I don't know. I did hear something that caused me pause with the, this information that's supposedly coming from the Pleiadians is that their main concern is population control. That raises an eyebrow for me. Uh, that's a, that's a bit of a concern, um, but then again, I've heard other information that's fantastic from so-called Pleiadians. Uh, so I would just say, uh, I, it depends on the information that you're getting. Weigh it with yourself. Um, population control, I believe, is just a farce. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time I checked, you could fit the entire Earth's population in Miami, Florida. So I just don't see that. So I do believe – maybe this will clarify – I do believe that there are uh, malevolent entities contacting humanity and benevolent entities. So you know, the scriptures say test the spirits to make sure. Mm. Um, every, every scripture that we know of has an antagonistic species, so – be cautious and they always parade themselves as oh we're here to help <laughs> oh <laughs> you know? yeah yeah we had an interesting experience uh, last october we went to a um a conference called probe in the northeast of england uh, northwest of england and there was a young lady in uh, there who was channeling an entity called anu and it was it was it was very interesting and very dramatic but what concerned me was there was this um, re uh, this uh, uh, entity called Anu. It was basically saying, yeah, we've screwed you over and really uh, wrecked humanity for several thousand years. But uh, if you show me love, then I'll be able to help you. And I'm thinking, ooh, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would say that now if you get on like YouTube and I, – I, I, there are a lot of people who are, you know, glitter and rainbows about these entities. My litmus test is the information that's either being channeled or given whatever means. Is it uh, bringing your attention to the present moment, or is it always putting some event off into the future that never happens? Um, 
I like to always say that we, on an individual level and a collective level, are always crucified between two thieves, the thief of the past and the thief of the future. Which and, and this this would go with emotions too, you know, uh, regret, guilt, that keeps us stuck in the past, and worry and fear keeps us stuck in the future. But the only place that you really have any power of creation is in the present moment. So I would say I don't care if you're hearing from the from the Pleiadians or the reptilians or the or the the Nordics or whatever. Uh, I don't care um, if they are drawing your attention and your power away from the present moment. It's probably not for your benefit. Probably mm-hmm. not for your benefit. Oh wow! No, oh, and that, that's, that's a great point to make as well because uh, people that have got an interest in that sort of area, they think that it's all spaghetti and unicorns. You know, it's just going to be uh, they, they're going to come and uh, and and save us and and everything. So it's you're just externalizing your power away from from what's on the earth to something that you you don't even know if it really exists right uh now i will tell people um how down and this it seems like i'm going around the lake but i'm a virgo so bear with me how the website downloaded content came about was um whenever i was writing with zen in the car dot com uh uh I got too far into activism, and I felt like I needed to get back into my literary writing, so I began a serial novel. Um, you know, Every time I wrote a chapter, I would publish it. It is a novel, uh, and whenever Zen in the Car was retired, I uh, took the serial novel and the world of the serial novel to base it as the foundation for the website DownloadedContent.com. Um, now, th- that particular serial novel, it's funny that we, we got on this subject, deals with uh, the metaphysical, uh, other entities, um, other dimensions, astral travel, very Dr. Strange-ish type stuff. Um, and you can begin reading that. Um, just When you go to DownloadedContent.com, look on the sidebar and you'll see Prologue, and then you'll see Heaven, Hell, Limbo, and the Hottest Angel of Death I Ever Met, chapters 1 through 13. And then zero one one zero slash two three three two. Those are all story arcs in the the serial novel that covers all of this type of stuff, um, and it deals with reptilians and Pleiadians. It is I do, I do put everything under fiction, but those that particular serial novel is based off of my firsthand experiences with these types. So you have to be cautious uh, when you start talking to an audience and gauge. Where they're at. If I were to go on CNN or Fox and start talking about Pleiadians, I'm going to last about five seconds. <laughs> you know, clearly with you guys, I could talk about this type of thing. Uh, so, in my personal experiences outside of our four dimensions of time and space, uh, you do have some malevolent entities out there, and you got some benevolent entities out there, and we did uh, reach a a transition point on December the 21st, 2012, and uh, um, it's exciting, uh, and I don't think that, that we need to panic about it. Uh, I think from my personal experience, there has been uh, entities that have been quarantined on this planet uh, that have been manipulating us for a very long time for purposes that weren't good for us, and I believe that we got some help. Uh, here here recently, and that basically those of us who are awake or enlightened or whatever whatever term feels comfortable for you, I think we're the cleanup crew. Um, we're the, the generation that is giving birth to the next stage in evolution. And and I think that if <laughs> anybody who's ever seen Men in Black, the first movie, there's a part where Tommy Lee Jones throws tabloid magazines on the, uh, the the hood of the car and says, this is where we get our intergalactic news. And that sounds funny, and it plays well in a comedy, but if you really want to know what's going on in around you in the metaphysical, watch movies from Hollywood. They are just pounding you with so much truth. It's veiled, but if you know how to decode it, it's telling you what's going on. Uh, you know, you have th- this uh, surge of movies that are talking about human evolution, like the X Men movies, uh, where evolution doesn't take place over millions of years; it takes place in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, 
uh, you have these superhero movies coming out that continuously use Christ imagery and associate it with each individual here. That the that the this idea of the Christ or Messiah is not isolated in a singular person. It's within each and every one of us that we have to come to attention to, cultivate, and and exponentiate it out to others. And uh, there's a a prophecy, uh, a Gnostic prophecy called the Return of the Horai, um, and it's on the back of the one dollar bill over here. You know, in America, you get people freaking out about that. Oh, it's the new the new world order. No, it's until the many become the one and the new order of the ages. And if you look at it and you do all the math and all the esoteric numbers, it goes from 1776 and the all-seeing eye of of Horus comes back in December the 21st, 2012. Well, according to the prophecy, Horus or Ra would return and through his eyes, he would wake up the many eyes of Horus. That's all of us, you know. the book of the revelation and all of these about the apocalypse which is the unveiling or the revelation is it is not some jewish carpenter coming back on a horse you know in the sky no messiahs don't do that they always sneak in through the back door mm-hmm. it's talking about the return of the christ spirit in all of us all of us yeah. not some outside savior and the 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 best Way that I know how to describe it is if anybody who's seen the Matrix trilogy, uh, there's a scene where uh, Neo is is in Zion and this the, the character's name is Kid. Uh, he kind of worships Neo as the Messiah because you know he's the Messiah for that age or whatever. And uh, he said, "You saved me, Neo." And Neo looked at him and said, "No, I didn't. You saved yourself." And that ultimately is the message of every single Messiah, if you read it correctly, is that you have to save yourself. Mm. Yeah, 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 that's something we talk about quite often. People need to to realize who they are and what what this is all about. Grow up. They need to grow up. That's what people need to do. They need to grow up because we're we're treated like children. We're kept in an adolescent phase completely. Look at look at the way they advertise to us, uh, and it works. So you know we need to grow up. Sorry. No, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, and, and they use a lot of subliminal messages. Um, I would recommend to anybody who's afraid of, you know, like for example, if you go, I'm a recovered alcoholic. I openly talk about that because if it helps somebody else get out of it, great. But if you go into your liquor store or your gas stations over here and you see Bud Light or Miller Light, they spell it L I G H T. That's not how you spell it. It's supposed to be spelled L I T E. Mm. So why are they using the word light? To a trace because subliminally on a collective consciousness we're all seeking the light, you know. So they use subliminal messages and symbology to misdirect us. Um, if you under now the, the, that science that technology is not evil, it's neutral like any type of magic, and magic is nothing more than science. Um, and if you ask anybody who uh, is proficient in magic, they'll tell you there is no black and white magic. There is no left and right hand path. Magic itself is neutral. It's like a knife. I could cut you with the knife or I could cut you a piece of bread with the knife. Um, my suggestion is for anybody who doesn't want to be manipulated through subliminal messages is pick up Carl Jung's book, Man and His Symbols. Read that book. Um, and you will be able to decipher the symbolism that people use to manipulate you, and you'll be immune to it. Um, mm-hmm. My suggestion is take that science and reverse engineer it to do good, to wake others up, to help them out. Um, and uh, uh, the, the best way that I know how – I started using what's called a hand mandala. You see Hindus you know, do shapes and things with their hands, mm-hmm. and now there's a show on Netflix called The Magicians where they call it hand tuts, um, where it's casting magical spells with the shape of your fingers, and, and you, you, know, you do it in a very artsy type way. Um, if you look at pictures of the Illuminati and, the, and these leaders of the world, you know, the world uh, they, they pull up, put up the, uh, the devil horns. You guys have seen that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and people freak out about it. Well, when you take the hand symbol of what they're doing and you put it into a glyph, it's the pentagram. It's a star that's upside down, 
Now you don't it, it, you don't realize that it's having an effect on your subconscious because you're you're not taking the hand gesture and putting it to symbolism, but it still has an effect on you. Yeah, there you go, Andy. You got it. Mm. Now that right there, if you draw it out, it's an upside down star. So mm. subliminally, what does the star mean? It mean a star is represents the human form: two hands, two legs, and a head. An upside down star, a pentagram, means falling from divinity, falling from grace. So when somebody throws that hand symbol up, even if you don't know what it means, it's a, it sets you on a path to do things that make you break away from your own divinity. So how does that look in reverse? Well, pull up a picture of any you know Renaissance-era image of Christ. He has two fingers up, two fingers and the thumb up. Now, and when you take that and you translate it to a glyph, it's the, it's the pentacle. The star in its correct position, which is the head going back up to divinity. And so you'll see images of Christ with the two fingers and the thumb pointed at his heart, which represents the heart chakra. And then his right hand is pointing up. So when you look at this image on a subliminal level, it's telling you to return to your own divinity. Get your energy up to your heart chakra and, your, and use your right brain, your intuition, your imagination. Very powerful stuff. Very powerful stuff. Mm. So, you know, don't be afraid of their tactics and their and their mind control. Learn it, reverse engineer it, and help your fellow man. Yeah, oh, wow, that's uh, fascinating information. That Daniel, I'm not not something I've come across before. Um, we've got a, a, what I think is quite a good question here from Aid, and uh, Aid's saying, "Can you ask Daniel?" How we can use this information positively to fight the elite? All right. Um, well, an, an example is, is one what I just said, which is uh, uh, have you guys seen Doctor Strange? I don't think I have. No, have I've you, not. No. Okay. Have you seen posters of Doctor Strange where he's actually using the hand symbol that I just described? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay, well, anybody who's listening, Google Doctor Strange movie poster, and you'll see that Doctor Strange has the thumb and the tooth, the, the, the pointer finger and the middle finger up. Now, Hollywood is using that same symbology, and that is the symbol that you'll see Christ using. In your everyday life, whenever you're waving to people, start using that hand symbol. And what you're doing is you're triggering in people's subconsciousness you know, and, and it can just be for a second. Sometimes you only get to be with a person for a, a moment to make a change, and it can be just as powerful as if you take them under your wing and train them for years. So when you only have those instances, use start using that hand symbol, and that hand symbol will ins, will, will trigger on on the collective subliminal that person on a path to ascend. Um, uh, the words that you use. Uh, uh, and don't be too meticulous about it, but make sure you use positive words. Um, you know, the Bible says if there's anything that's that's beautiful, if there's anything that's that's worthy of praise, if there's anything positive, think on these things. You know, uh, that's a, a good way to do it. But but like I said, the most important thing, the most important person to start with is yourself. Whenever you get up in the morning, go into the mirror. You know, and what I like to do is 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 before I even get coffee, I got positive music playing. It doesn't matter what type of music. I like hip hop. S uh, Club Seven. Do what? S Club Seven. The world's is greatest a, band. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do it. Look at, yeah. Whatever makes you feel good. Start that. Then go to the mirror. And what I like to do is think of three things that I'm happy about, and 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 allow my brain to come up with an answer. You know, your brain is it, it has to give you an answer. Start learning how to ask the right questions. If you ask questions like, why am I so pathetic? Why am I so useless? Why am I so depressed? Your brain has to give you the, the, the answers to it, even if it has to invent the answer. So if you ask it, why am I so depressed, it's going to give you an inventory. Uh, because you're, you're an idiot, because you're ugly, because you're poor, because you're useless, because you're powerless. Why are you doing that to yourself? Ask the right question. And your brain will give you the correct answers. You know, uh, if, if you are depressed, say, "How can I become empowered?" Your brain will tell you how. 
All right. So start with yourself first, and then go to other people. It, it, but typically, what I found out is if you start with yourself first, and then you go about your day, find people in your day that, even if it's a small thing, if you got no money, you could compliment somebody. You can, you know, you can tell somebody, uh, "I like your smile," or "That's a nice coat," or and we don't. Once you're conscious about these things and you give the the, the right intent when you do it, not just to be, you know, uh, social, but to really mean it. You know, even if somebody's really nasty to you, find one positive thing and tell that person and watch it change. You know, we have more power than we think we do as dominoes. You know, be a domino. So. Uh, Basically, every person that you come in contact with, try to make their life a little better, and and that's really how you defeat the elite is one, start with yourself, uh, and then what you get from that, take it everywhere that you can take it. They really – the only power that the elite have over us is the power that we give them, uh, the power that, that we lease out to them. You defeat the elite individually whenever you just make the decision. They have no power over your choice to be happy in life. Uh, I, I listen to a lot of self-help. I think it's great stuff, but uh, materialistic people, they go out, they get a job because they were told to, or they go to university. And then if they lose that job or lose that degree, they have nothing left. They have no security net. If you choose if – you, if you look at what makes you happy and passionate in life – you will get money or resources to survive and thrive. Happiness is the security net. Happiness is, is the positive uh, emotion, vibration, thoughts is the, the atom bomb against the elite. Right? You do that, and you will see that your life kind of goes into an automatic upswing where they have no power over you. The only power that exists is the power of consciousness. You're making some great points, and 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 I'm just sort of yeah. sat here listening to you, and uh, I'm absorbing it. I'm sure Andy is as well. Yeah, I was um, on. I was I'm on sure the listeners are. Uh, but yeah, it, it's some great points. Well, for me, that that kind of parallels how things have, have changed for me. Um, I changed the way I look at the world. And the way the world reacted to me changed very different, different, in a different way. But you said there we, we all need to start asking the questions and asking the questions of ourselves, which I'm absolutely in agreement with. That, that kind of, I think that is something that's been very instrumental in the development of my life. But I think, and equally important, we need to learn how to listen to those answers when they come because all too often we, we ignore our instinct at our great peril. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, get, whenever you do ask the questions, and don't let it become a ritual. You know, make, it, uh, make it something where you really uh, invest your emotions into it. You, know, you really allow it to percolate when those answers come. Uh, I mean I tend to do it you know, first thing in the morning before I, I deal with it. We're, we've been caught in this thing where you know, everybody's in a hurry all the time, yeah. all the time. And the greatest thing that I've done to improve my life is shut off my cell phone service, period, uh -huh. okay? Because you have people who are so integrated, and, and I hate to call out uh, people of our own ilk. Technology is great. Don't get me wrong. The internet is fantastic, but it can be a trap, and we have this expectation to have 24-hour-a-day access to other people through little green dots on social media. You know, to the point of of it causing a lot of anger and animosity when they don't get instantaneous responses. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you know, and it's to me, it's and I I got caught up in it for a minute where, you know, I'm in a good mood and I'm texting somebody and, and I say an expletive in the text. I don't realize that on the other end of that technological tether, they're having a bad day. They're in a bad mood, and what is sent through is going to be translated through the emotion that they're at. And then it causes a big argument. Yeah. Like if I say, hey, Andy, screw you, okay, and I'm happy and jovial and I'm just being you know, playful, and you're in a bad mood, and you read, screw you. Well, now we're at war. 
<laughs> yeah. No, you, if that was me, Daniel, you'd get a screw you as well, brother, and a big laughing smiley face back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so we, we've been conditioned here recently to, to be in such a hurry and to be too interconnected. So what I did was I just said, you know, I don't really need a cell phone. If you know the outside world is going to happen and it doesn't need my constant attention, you know, uh, when I shut off the internet, when I shut off any type of communication to me, I have my own world that I can live in, you know, um, and the outside world goes on. If I if I if my attention is absolutely needed, somehow or another, it it will come to me, you know. But learn to to disconnect from the collective consciousness for a little bit. And in, whenever you do that, like I do a lot of meditation, and meditation can be done in, in in an individual way. It doesn't have to be in lotus position or om or whatever. You know, washing dishes and listening to Johnny Cash can be great meditation. And and bring yourself to the present moment to ask those questions of yourself, you know, uh, and really let and feel the responses as they come in. Um, have, are you guys familiar with Max Planck's work? Nope. No. Um, uh, Planck is, is the guy who coined the phrase the matrix uh, back in the 30s, I believe. Uh, and he gets into you know, quantum physics and the unified field that, uh, that we are all interconnected uh, and that consciousness is uh, – consciousness is, it is a prerequisite even to your DNA. Um, and there's an excellent book – Called uh, the Divine Matrix by Greg Barton, that talks about how you shape your reality by your consciousness, uh, and we—I mean, it's—it's it's so true. Uh, people believe that prayer is the words, and you'll hear people. I've been praying for this for years, and it just hasn't come. Well, the universe doesn't speak in words; it speaks in emotion. The language of the universe is your emotion, the emotion that you send out. So saying, oh, God, please heal me of this disease, that's – the universe isn't really getting that if you don't believe that you can be cured. Uh, it's going to give you what you feel. If you are constantly asking for something out of want, you are getting exactly what you're asking for, which is lack of. I want to be healed. So the universe says, okay, he wants to keep wanting it, and it's like a carrot dangling in front of you. Yeah, you know I, 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 mean? I, I, I completely – Absolutely, completely understand where you're coming from, and um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the second hour. But I think we've um, we're, we're about at, at one hour, and it's about time that we had a record. I think, Do you, don't, don't don't you think, Andy? Yeah, it's about time we all grabbed a cuppa, uh, take a pee break if we need one. So yeah, we'll put on one of my favourite tracks from Jason's best mate Heath. Thanks, Heath. I really love this one. We'll be back shortly, folks. <laughs> Take me back to my boat on the river I need to go down I need to come down Take me back to my boat on the river And I won't cry out anymore Time starts still as I gaze in the water me down, touching me gently with the waters that flow past my boat on the river, so I won't cry out anymore. Oh, the river is deep, the river, it touches my life like the waves on the sand. To lead to tranquility base Where the frown on my face disappears Take me down to my boat on the river And I won't cry out anymore Oh, the river is deep The river, it touches my life like the wind on the sand and all roads 
a lead to tranquility base Where the frown on my face disappears Take me down to my boat on the river And I won't cry out anymore Take me down to my boat on the river And I won't cry out anymore And I won't cry out anymore And I won't cry out anymore My name is Michael Obanissia and I'm the producer-director of The Great British Mortgage Swindle and you're listening to AutonomousMedia.net And welcome back to Raconteurs News and we've been having a ent- uh, thoroughly uh, gripping first hour with Daniel Lewis Crumpton from all the way over in Georgia in the USA. Um, so welcome back. Welcome back, Jason. Welcome back, Daniel. Oh, I needed that. Good evening. <laughs> yeah, I hope you enjoyed uh, Heath's little bit of tranquility there. It uh, it seemed to be quite appropriate for the middle of the show there. Yeah, well, I I, I did enjoy it. I've got to say, it's a great tune that is that is made, is created. Uh, but I'm looking forward to the end much more. Oh, don't give away any secrets there, Jason. Okay. <laughs> so, Daniel, um, we, we've um, we've covered your your book and the, the kind of ideas in that in the first half. Um, where would you like to go with the second half? Uh, well, um, I guess my podcast, uh, I, like I mm. said, I just, I started that on the, uh, the 15th, uh, of, of this past m- or this month. Uh, and I, I'm really excited about it. Uh, so far in, in the past two weeks, I've put out 19 podcasts. Um, and, you know, I'm doing it all myself. So it, it it's take, it's real time consuming, but, uh, I try to cover, you know, topics like this. I do have guests and it's more of a, it's, it's not as professional as this. I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's more of when I was doing, uh, network radio, I found that when guests would stay after the show was off and we would talk, better information came out. Uh, and it came out in, in a more relaxed way. Yeah. <clears throat> and so that, that's kind of the nature of the podcast is it's me and, and friends having a conversation and people get to eavesdrop in on it. And, uh, you know, we've, we, I'll talk about anything from politics to the metaphysical to, uh, you know, I just cover the gambit because I'm fascinated and, and, and intrigued by so many different topics. You, you have to be mm-hmm. nowadays. Um, and, uh, so I, you know, I launched that on the 15th. Uh, and one of the reasons I did on the 15th is that was the anniversary of my, my father passing. And, um, I talk about my father, my parents a lot. You know, they're my, they're the titans of my life. But, um, it was actually, funny story, um, it was actually when my father passed away or crossed over. I don't like the word died, and I don't really like the word crossed or pass away. Mm-hmm. Uh, where I was a Baptist, I was a Sunday school teacher, and in the, in the, in the, the church, they tell you don't talk to the dead. Don't try to communicate with the other side. That's like a, a sin, you know, and, um, the nature of how my father left, uh, I had to, you know, uh, give him CPR. Uh, and when I was giving him CPR, when I opened up his mouth, his lungs were so, were filled with his last breath, and they flooded into me. And I heard in a young man's voice, but I knew that it was my father. I felt a, an instantaneous peace just fill every atom of my body. And I heard him say, don't panic, son. Everything's going to be okay. And that was a huge paradigm shift for me um, because I knew that I'd been lied to or I had allowed myself to be lied to. Uh, and that began my journey uh, into spirituality because I knew that you could contact other realms. Uh, the other side can communicate with you. And um, I, it was just a matter of me figuring out how to do it permanently uh to maintain contact because at first it's very fleeting and anybody out there who's ever had a loved one that it that that left them it's a rough it's rough it's extremely rough 
And, uh, you know, I was, I'm, I'm grateful that I had the experience because me and my dad had coffee every day. You know, I'd come home from work or whatever, stop by his house, and, and we'd talk about politics and the elections and things like that. And to me, it was uh, unacceptable that I would continue my life without being able to communicate with him. And so through my journeys through Buddhism and Hinduism and other faiths, I found a way to do it, to maintain contact with with the other side. And the relationship me and my father have now is greater than it ever was. Sure, I can't hug him. Um, I can't smell him. You know, little things like that you miss later. But as far as communicating, you you know, and I tell people who lose a loved one, they don't go anywhere. They go everywhere. And if you can tap into it, they never leave you. They never forsake you, and they can become your greatest allies on this side. Uh, and so in honor uh, of my, my dad, I launched the podcast on that day because if it hadn't been for him, I never would have got into politics, and he was the first person to introduce me to things like George Norrie, you know, coast to coast and, and, and the metaphysical. Uh, so, but, but but it it sounds like that it, it was a pretty one-sided relationship. You know, I mean, you were – into him and, and into what he was into as well, but it, it seemed that like the perhaps it wasn't rescinded in in the same way. Could you elaborate? Well, I, well, I'm just saying that, that, that you speak so highly of your dad. Oh yeah, and God, we all do. I mean, I, I, my dad's the best bloke in in the entire world. Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel that as though that that the same respect was given back to you. And this is probably more about me than it is about you, but do, do you feel that the, the, the same was given back to you, um, the same amount of attention, the same amount as you as you gave to, to your dad? Absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. We fed off of each other. We challenged one another. Uh, people, people, intellectually, we were the best competitors, and and I don't mean competition in the way that the world typically means it, which is beat the other guy down. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you go back to what the the concept of competition is, uh, it's competing to lift one another up, or as the Bible would say, "Iron sharpeneth iron." Um, and we fed off of each other uh, with knowledge and with with philosophy and concepts. It was, you know, there was a lot of things like uh, he, he would uh, make light of a lot of things that I was interested in. But he would, you know, like UFOs. But then again, if, if I brought him a copy of The Day After Roswell, he would read it, <laughs> you know. Uh, and politics was the same, you know. He was a veteran of two foreign wars: the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Um, and I showed him actually Alex Jones's uh, terror storm, and when he heard the part in Terror Storm about our president wanting the USS Liberty to be sunk, you know I want that GD boat at the bottom of the ocean. My dad felt he he winced like he lo- it looked like somebody kicked him in his stomach because at that moment he realized that though he was a young man when he enlisted, and he believed what the government told him his whole life that he was doing it for a noble cause. God, country, freedom, and liberty, that it was a lie. It was an all a lie. Now, it didn't mean that his intentions were, were, were wrong, but the intentions of those who fed him the, the BS was very wrong. And at 72 years old, you know, that's when Ron Paul was running. This guy, my dad, uh, picked up his cane, you know, uh, and, and became a delegate, and he injected himself into the political system and, and would carry. Uh, 9-11 was an inside job uh, documentaries to the Air Force Base and pass them out uh, now if he had if it had been one sided he, he would have just shut your mouth boy you know I served my country you know the, t- the typical thing you get from a lot of a lot of servicemen or retired servicemen I, I fought for my country but they won't examine why yeah and nobody had ever presented to him that maybe he had been, he had been manipulated until I started doing the research. So yeah, it was a give and take. Uh, you know, when uh, Saving Private Ryan came out, he made me read Mein Kampf, and uh, yeah, it was it was very reciprocal. And I'm fortunate. I know a lot of people don't ha- aren't fortunate enough to have that type of relationship with their parents, and I, I, I'm sorry uh, for that. Uh, but you know, I did, and so I communicate from that place. Um, but I also think you know I ha- I'm the child of eight kids. But I have a lot of siblings who are bitter towards my parents, 
And it's not that my parents were bitter towards them. It's just the, the way that they understood the communication from from our parents. You know, They didn't see that an intellectual challenge was a quest that our parents were, were sending them on, so they chose not to take the quest, and they didn't grow. Yeah. You know? So, uh, but look, parents don't get an instruction manual when we come into the world. They do the best they can. <laughs> you know? So you can either be a victim and have victim mentality and say, oh, all my, parent, all my problems come from my parents. Or you could just understand that, hey, man, they're human too. But, but that, that's a big problem at the moment, isn't it? Is that we have got this victim mentality. We are encouraged to become, you know, it, it's sort of like scrambling to, to see who can be the biggest victim. We've got that victim mentality at the moment, haven't we? It, 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 when it comes to anything, really, um, even somebody who's posted something online about you and, and the, uh, you know, it's, it's upset you, who, that's now a crime. It's ridiculous. Yeah, uh, victim mentality is great. It's a great crutch because it takes your it, it takes responsibility away from the individual um, to create their own reality. Uh, people love being a victim, even if they don't say it. They love it because it 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 takes responsibility away from them, and they don't want it. You know, uh, so you know, and I, I'm a huge believer in reincarnation and pre existence. I believe that you choose before you get here. The circumstances of your birth and life. So it's like Led Zeppelin said, it's nobody's fault but yours, <laughs> you know. Uh, but that's just me. Like I said, I'm not trying to build a church. But I, through through my studies and through my personal experiences, you choose the circumstances of your youth uh, and 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 how you're going to cultivate in this in this life. Um, so, you know, but that that's me. It, but yeah, victim mentality is is so rampant. It's so rampant, and and it's because people are afraid of taking control uh, of of their own stuff, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And and you Only know, bug brush man, that is absolutely on the nail. Nobody wants to take responsibility for what they do, and so they try to uh, they try to remove themselves away from somebody who's perpetrated something that's gone wrong or the, that's been done wrong. And, and they try to position themselves as the victim. Yeah, um, and what's funny about it is, is I've been accused, and I'm guilty as charged, of uh, having superhero syndrome, uh, trying to save everybody. You, you know, uh, and I recently wrote an article, uh, and since I do know that people are getting away from reading, uh, whenever I post an article on my website, they're called squalls, which are isolated articles that are just what I'm thinking whenever. I've started to, to actually read the articles for people in a, in a 10 minute or less YouTube video. But uh, I recently wrote one called The Consequence of Sound, Letting People Screw Up. And uh, kind of, uh, it was me talking about, you know, um, you have to, sometimes whenever you, it, are surrounded by negative people or with people who are inundated with victim mentality, you think that you're, do, you're helping them by staying in that circle, and you're not. Uh, a, a, a good bit of the time, people – there's a, something that, that I saw on a Facebook wall that said some people don't want to be fixed because being broken gets them attention. Right. right? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. When, when you identify those people, listen to me. Get away. Eliminate those people from your life. They will suck the energy out of you. And you may have the best of intentions, man, but if I'm trying to lift somebody up that's fighting against me, the only thing that can happen is me falling down with them. Yeah. You know. Now, that's not to say that there aren't people out there who are in a bad place that truly, genuinely want help. That's worth the investment. But – if, for example, Jason or Andy, if you if you present a problem to me that you would like advice or a solution, and I give you the solution or the advice, and then you immediately give me fifty reasons why it's not going to work for you, yeah, that means that means that you enjoy that blanket you're wrapped up in, and I'm gone. You know, I got other people to help. You know, you're not being a superhero by allowing five thousand people to fall off of a building for one when that one jumped. <laughs> okay. So, 
that's that's what I got to say about that. When you identify anybody or more than one person in your life that has that type of victim mentality or is a an energy vampire, get away. Do everything that you can to get them out of your life. You're not helping them. You're hurting yeah, yourself. Absolutely. I had one in my life for about twelve years who was an energy vampire, and she she really did feed off me. And um, there's no way that I would go back to that sort of thing. No, you need to get your own. You get your own stuff straight, and then the, the, everything else will fix itself. Yeah, and typically, man, it it usually is with a spouse. It's usually with a spouse or a relative, and and you get come, that comes with all kinds of uh, obligations. You believe, you know, uh, but. But look, man, if, if if you're not okay first, you're not going to help anybody else. And if, if uh, like I said, when somebody recently, I think it was Chuck Ocelli, me and him had a conversation. He asked me why I hung up my uh, my activist spurs, and I summated it by saying at the end of the day, there was no more joy in it. And that goes for any type of thing that you're invested in, even marriage, you know, especially marriage. Uh, if there's no joy left in it and it's more of a fight. It, that means it's over, okay? <laughs> so, you know, don't prolong the pain. No, absolutely. Uh, you need to turn your mic on, Andy, uh, before you start talking. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Yeah, I've, personal experience, I I can agree with that 100%. I was... I got married. I, I swore blind I'd leave it till I was 30. I wouldn't get married till I was 30. I actually lasted till I was 32, now, that marriage, in one form or another, carried on for 10 years. But I will, in all honesty, I've got to say that we were actually miserable before we got married. It was a ridiculous idea to get married. We got married 36 weeks to the day since we met. That was far too quick. And it was 10 years of abject misery. Uh, if I could have uh, took your piece of advice there and just like, this relationship's broken, let's leave it. Leave it on the side of the road and move on. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my life would have been a lot different, but I'm glad I took those uh, blind alleys that I did take at that time because I wouldn't be in the position I'm now. Uh, I might be in a better position, but I, I, I wouldn't trade wishing for a better position than the position I'm in now because uh, <laughs> my life's... A whole lot more interesting than it was a couple of years ago, and uh, I'm I'm grateful for that. You, you're obsessed with positions, Andy. You're just <laughs> obsessed with it. these positions. What position do I want to be in? I might be in a good position. I might be in a bad position. I might be in a good position, but it could be better. But you're obsessed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and being a husband or being a wife or whatever is a, is a, is a nice identity. It's a nice mask, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that you can invest in. I, I was married for 13 years, uh, and, uh, that was basically because of religious indoctrination. And, and I don't want to sound flippant about the marriage, but, you know, it ended very, rather, uh, Hannibal Lecterish, I would say, very messily, <laughs> you know, with me being stabbed a few times. And uh, after that, I was like, you know, even after that happened, I was like, yeah, but I, I swore before God <laughs> that I would, you know what I mean? And it's like, what? You know, you stay attached to these titles and these masks that you wear because we're afraid to, to change identity or to, to get to a deeper serve. But even, even through all that, you wouldn't, you know, you are the sum of your experiences. So sometimes we look back on things in our life and we, why did that happen? Or we have a lot of anger and bitterness. But if you really glean it, you know, uh, every situation, you know, I have a, a fortune cookie that I've kept for years that says nothing is a waste of time if you learn something. You know, nothing is a waste of time if you no. learn something. That's that's right. That's that's what you're going to do. Whatever experience you have in your life, if you learn from it, then uh, it's it, it's not a bad experience. No, no. Uh, you could be bitter about it, and, and you, always me, but that's not going to get you anywhere. Did did you uh, have? You spoke earlier on that you were quite active and a, a scholar of the Baptist Church. What, did you have an epiphany that just sort of like led you away from that, or did you uh, just sort of drift away? 
It, it was it was a, a combination of one my, my father passing uh, and then the revelation that you could communicate with the other side. That was the major thing. But what really got me um, away from it was. Uh, I was an apologist, and what an apologist is, it's not what it sounds like. It's a, a defender of the faith. And so I, it was my duty in the church to study other faiths, other cults, and religions, to study them back and forth to defend Christianity. And um, what you always hear in that circle is uh, – oh, his name is escaping me right now. Um, who's, who's the contemporary? Oh, I can't believe that name just escaped me. He was a contemporary. <laughs> Do what now? Cliff Richard. No. Oh, goodness. It's not – is it Josephus? Yeah, it's Josephus, right? That The the, the extra-biblical proof that, that Jesus of Nazareth actually walked the earth was Josephus, okay? Mm-hmm. And so you'll hear Christian apologists cite Josephus. And one day I said, you know what? i got to be honest. i got to be intellectually honest with myself. There is no other evidence that there was an actual historical Jesus Christ except for what's in you know, jo- Josephus. Let me go read it. Well, when you actually do, when you go and you pick this huge book up – now, Josephus lived at, you know, in Jerusalem at the time that, he, that Christ supposedly walked, Jesus of Nazareth. And so if there's anybody who would be able to attest to these miraculous things, it would be this cat. But he's only men- Jesus of Nazareth is only mentioned twice in the entire record of Josephus' writings. And when you read it, one, it, when it speaks about Yeshua, or I call him Yeshua, um, it gives you a completely different version of what happened with Passion Week. And it was that the, the, Jewish, the Sanhedrin was very upset because Pontius Pilate had become the curator and had lined the streets uh, up to his palace with, the, with, with their pantheon of gods. And so the Sanhedrin was not happy about this, and so they, they uh, went and stirred up a crowd, and there was a days-long protest that was uh, going to get violent where the Romans were in a, in a precarious situation with this occupation that these Jews might you know, do something you – know, and this is what Josephus describes during Passion Week with the Sanhedrin and Pontius Pilate. And then mixed into this narrative, it says, oh, yeah, and Jesus was performing miracles at that time. And that's all he says. Okay, That's all he mentions. Nothing about these miracles, nothing about you know any of the things you read in the New Testament. And the second mention it, uh, is when Josephus actually calls Jesus the Messiah, the Christ. Well, there's a problem because we know that Josephus, Josephus died an Orthodox Jew. He never converted to Christianity. So the two mentions of Jesus of Nazareth in the only extra-biblical proof that we have that there was a historical figure, it's obvious that it's, it was placed in there at a later date, probably by the Vatican. Most researchers say it was the Vatican. So when you take Josephus out of the equation, you go, oh my god, what proof is there of historical Christ? And that's what got me into to seeking other uh, explanations and got me to the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Library and the Gnostic Gospels. Now, I'm not saying there was no historical man. I believe there was. Is, is the New Testament a report uh, of exactly what happened? You're an idiot if you think that, in my opinion. You ain't got no Hebrews walking around named, named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are English names. Okay. Uh, there's cert- we know there was no Jesus because there was no letter J until uh, you know f- way later. So we, when you understand that, you understand that, that the name Jesus is an amalgamation of Zeus, you, you know, like Santos Bonacci says, uh, yes, and Zeus. It was a hybrid name. Uh, but do I believe that the character is based off of an actual person? Yeah, of course. I, I believe that. I don't think that you have to believe that in order to be, quote, a Christian. And the way, the way that I say it is uh, um, you, you know, the, the message of the Bible and the, and the Christ is this, simplified. The law and the prophets or the Old Testament hangs on two commandments. There are only two commandments in the, in the totality of the Bible, only two. Love God whatever God is, with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Christ himself said that's the only two laws. That's it. 
So when you get into all this dogmatic stuff about don't do this on this day, don't eat this, don't wear this, da 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 and you compare it to what Jesus or Yeshua said, which is there's only two laws, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, And you bring it down to that, then the rest of this stuff is like we said earlier. It's just points of contention and division. But uh, and I've often said, I said, look, if loving God, whatever God is, with all your heart and loving your fellow man as yourself, if you can do that through reading a, a comic book like Spider-Man, Batman, or Superman, there you go. Whatever it is that's going to give you that information that you can put into practice, then there, make that your religion. I don't care. you know, Because to me, the Bible is a very old comic book. <laughs> I mean, you have superheroes mm. in an ancient world, and that's what it is. You know? Everything is really the cycle of the sun, you know, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Um, our problem or our blind spot is is that we apply that to whatever particular hero or messiah outside of ourselves. But very rarely do we realize that these stories are telling us about ourselves. When you say that uh, the Bible is essentially a comic book, I mean, it's a comic book that, let's be fair, in this last hour and, what, 35 minutes or whatever it's been, you you have cited quite a lot from this comic book. Sure, yeah, because that's... um, like uh, the Dalai Lama says, uh, when people ask the Dalai Lama, um, do you want people to convert to Buddhism? He says, no. Uh, stick with whatever country, area, and religion you were born into because you're going to understand the, the world and yourself through that avenue. I, I believe that religion is a maze. It's like the maze of the Minotaur, and there are several different entrance ways. Uh, for people on the other side of the globe or the flat earth or whatever, which I don't get into that either because I don't have a rocket ship and I can't tell you for myself what shape the freaking earth is. Don't care. But for religions, uh, are uh, it, they're like a maze, and depending on what is prevalent in your area, that is going to be your entrance way. For me, it happened to be through Christianity and through the Bible. So I'm going to go back to that a lot because that's the foundation of my evolution. Mm -hmm. But a Hindu, it's going to be the Vedas or the Bhagavad Gita. But it's still a doorway, you know. It's all of them are a doorway. So yeah, I uh, I I do use the Bible because it was the first text that I was educated in. But that's not to say, you know, uh, when I started reading the Bhagavad Gita, I was astounded at how it was telling the exact same story as the Bible. The same story with different beautiful words. Yeah, but, you know, uh, Krishna, Krishna, uh, you know, born of a virgin, walking on water, feeds five thousand. Uh, sure, he it, he took place that that story or history or whatever took place a long time before Christ, but it's the same hero mm-hmm. in a different form. Um, in a good way to look at it is in, – and I'm a huge comic book fan. I've been collecting comics since I could read. That's how I learned to read is in – you've got basically two different universes, the DC universe and the Marvel universe, but you will see that they both echo one another. You know, There is a Superman in the DC universe, but you also have his contemporary in the Marvel universe. Uh, his name is the Sentry. He gets his power from the sun. Uh, you know, He can – Go faster than a speeding bullet. He's bulletproof. It's the same archetype. It's the same story. You know, you have your your dark vigilante in DC, Batman, and you also have your dark vigilante in Marvel, the Punisher, or Pick. You know, so when I say Christ, it's the same archetype as a Hindu would say Krishna, or a Buddhist would say Siddhartha. I just I believe you know uh, the Bible and the King James language is just beautiful poetry. So for me, it's I, I consistently go back to it, but not saying you're going to go to hell if you don't read it. <laughs> you know, that's great explanation there, Daniel. I love the parallels with the the DC and the Marvel comic books. Um, we've got a fascinating comment here in the chat room. Uh, it's asking for advice now, whether it's general advice or they're asking you, I'm not sure. But I'm going to put it to you and see what you make of it, Daniel. Uh, Scribble has posted in the chat room, last time I walked into a church, all the lights went out. Should I see a guru? (laughs) (laughs) 
should you see a guru? Um, be your own guru is my, my first and foremost uh, comment on that. Um, but then again, um, in Gnosticism, there's a saying. It says that when the student is ready, the master will appear. Um, if you were to pull out a tarot deck, you'll see the card of the hermit. Um, now, um, I'm a huge Led Zeppelin fan. Uh, when I was a teenager, I mean, it defined who I was, and, and Led Zeppelin has a, uh, a film called The Song Remains the Same. I'm sure you guys have seen it, uh-huh. um, wh- where each band member has a fantasy sequence, and Jimmy Page's fantasy sequence is key in seeking spiritual evolution. Um, in, 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 Andy, have you seen this? No, have you seen I haven't. The song? Okay. Uh, Jason, have you seen The Song Remains no, the Same? No, I've not seen this film, no. I'm not a, a massive fan. Okay, well, some some are, some aren't. Uh, but YouTube, Jimmy Page's scene where he starts off as a mountain climber as a young man, and he sees the hermit uh, at the mountaintop, you know, in a cloak with a lantern, just like you see on uh, in in the 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 Rider Waite tarot deck. Um, okay. This represents uh, a mentor, the the hermit with the light. Okay, and. Uh, Jimmy Page ascends the mountain through his own efforts to reach the hermit, and then whenever the it, it, when, whenever he gets there, he sees the, the there's an old weathered and wrinkled man underneath the cloak, and then time reverses, and and this old man begins to get younger and younger and younger until it's an it's a mirror image of himself. So whenever you start to get into the metaphysical realms, whenever you need guidance from a quote guru. Or a mentor, uh, it's as easy as asking the universe to send you one, and then whenever the student is ready, a master will appear. But I would caution that person is there to give you information, and if this person is is correctly there in your life, that information is there to help you evolve past them. All right. Um, because you will, and I have in, in times past faced mentors that were very much like the Sith in Star Wars. They only give you information enough to keep you under their control, so you keep half, having to go back to them. Okay, stay, be cautious of those types of people. Um, so I would say, if you feel that you need to seek a, a guru, uh, sure, seek one out, but don't. Put yourself in a position where you become a slave. That this person's only rationing out information to you. Now, not that that's not to be confused with. Uh, uh, they're not going to give you all the answers right away. You don't give a baby a piece of steak; they'll choke to death. They'll give you milk, and as you mature, then you can get the deeper things. But uh, strange things like uh, you know. Uh, Lights going off in a church, you know. And I, I'd have to know this person's, and I do do personal readings, you know, if people get a hold of me. Um, so if, if this person feels compelled, they can reach me on Facebook or Skype, uh, Daniel Lewis Crumpton. Um, but if you feel like you you need a mentor, sure, ask the universe to send you one, and it will. But don't get into a trap of of becoming that person's perpetual, you know, Darth Vader, <laughs> you know. Andy, you need to uh, unmute yourself if you want to uh, talk to people. Thank yeah, you. The, 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 that's my schoolboy, second schoolboy error for the evening. Hopefully <laughs> it will be the last one. Yeah, what I wanted to say to that was absolutely wow, because that has mirrored my experience so much in the last couple of years. I I have, have learned to, to open up, to, to just ask the universe, say, right, this is my problem. What the hell am I going to do about it? And invariably the answer comes it's not always the answer you're expecting it's not even necessarily the answer you thought you wanted but the answer comes and if you follow your intuition if you follow that listen to that little voice that's telling you what that information or or the hints when someone suddenly appears in your life out of the blue you never expect all of a sudden presenting this scenario to you if you can actually listen then yeah, it works. Yeah, and I would I would highly recommend everybody go pick up uh, the book called The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. 
Very simple book. You can read it in about 30 minutes. It reads almost like a bedtime story, but it is one of the most powerful and profound books you can ever read on uh, synchronicity. Uh, and it explains in the book that synchronicity is the language uh, of the universe speaking to you. And it comes across as coincidences. Now, most people think that coincidences are, oh, it's just, oh, it's a, just a coincidence. No, it's a, I guess you could say it's an eddy in the, in the space time fabric that you need to pay attention. When you do pay attention to those, these synchronicities or these coincidences, more and more will, will appear to you quicker and more profound. And it's a bread trail from the universe so that you can reach your highest self. Or your own personal legend, as the book says. And it's it's like we were talking about. You just send it out to the universe and then just be aware. Be aware of – like I, I pay very close attention to cardinals, redbirds. Whenever a redbird appears, I know that something profound is about to happen to me. Uh, typically, cardinals represent the other side communicating with you. Um, you know, Whenever you're thinking of somebody and they suddenly call you, it's not just a coincidence. You know, this is you interacting with the universe, um, and so you're constantly transmitting out to the universe, and the universe is giving it back to you. So the the book, The Alchemist, is a go pick that book up. You can actually listen to it on YouTube for free if you're not a reader, and then put into practice what the boy in the story does, and it will guide you to these teachers or these gurus. And uh, but but the, you're going to have a multiplicity of le of teachers. And so learn what you can from each one because all of us are rungs on a ladder. You know, I have so many people underneath me that look to me as a teacher, but I don't want them to misunderstand that I have teachers above me. doesn't mean they're superior, and it does not mean that I'm superior to another person. All of us are walking a path. Some of us are leaving a trail for others. So – the, the where it comes where, the danger of gurus and this is real bad in the internet culture you know people like Max Egan people like David Icke people like Alex Jones Santos Bonacci they become worshipped and it's not their fault you know so I'm not blaming them but when you believe that one person has all the answers for you or for everyone you're on the wrong path man. <laughs> They have the information that they need at, at their evolution, and, and they're transmitting what you need at your evolution. But continue to, to go past your, your mentor or your guru. Yeah, that's great advice. Absolutely great advice. Um, what, 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 what do you think is infecting alternative media at the moment? I mean, it, it, it seems that we've got people that are, you know, really uh, pro-Trump. I'm sorry, I know we we, we uh, said that we wouldn't mention him, but what, what, Man, what do you think is driving it? I don't understand that mess. Uh, I don't understand anybody in the alternative media who ever used to be a Ron Paul or Liberty person seriously thinking that that that. That Trump is <laughs> – I don't yeah. get it, Jason. I don't it's understand. It's a joke, it. isn't it? It's a joke. I mean in America, and like I said before we went on the air, I don't really like talking about Trump. I've said everything I have to say, and it's really easy. I'm glad that he's president, and I was going to write an article about it. I haven't gotten around to it yet, but I will because that shows you the importance on my list, is why Trump is great for America from a non-Trump supporter, and it's this, Americans. You have a game show host for your president. Yep. It's a game show host. So it's great because for those of us who are awake and aware, uh, it, it the system is showing its true colors, and it's a game show. So all you got to do is with your consciousness change the channel. Um, so how, how these guys are uh, – are taking Trump seriously or are, are getting passionate about Trump on a day-to-day -day basis, basically it's because they don't want to cut their nose off to spite their face because right. they, they've become so ingrained with their identity and their medium and their network or their brand that it is a left-right thing and it is just a political thing. 
that now they have to double down. They they have to. Um, and so that they're stuck there. That's their arena. You know, if you look, dude, if you got a big network and you sell supplements or you sell this or that on your website, and that your bread and butter comes from you uh, catering to people who are in a political mindset, a left-right mindset, a your vote actually makes a damn mindset. Do you think that they're suddenly going to go? Okay, well that's bull crap. No, because most of us do this full time and we don't make a lot of money. You know, my my uh, primary source of income is my Patreon account, which only has one donor so far, uh, and that's for the podcast and the YouTube videos I produce and my novel. So, you know, if I come out and and if if I had a bunch of sponsors and I and those sponsors are uh, Trump leaning and I piss them off, well, I'm going hungry, aren't I? So, I think that's what you have in the alternative media. It's one, it's a pride thing. And it, then, of course, it's your pocketbook. It's money. Um, but it's a joke. I mean – but I'm glad that he's president because now those of us who really do have power, which is consciousness, and we do see that it's a game show. I mean we have a freaking game show host, and I'm not even joking. He literally is a game show host. Um, that means that my attention and my, uh, my uh, energy and resources is no longer required in the political system. So all I have to do is figure out where it needs to go. To uh, <clears throat> change the world for real, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, the, how did we end up there with with people actually believing that that Trump's for real? For me, I think that there's one important um, ingredient in that recipe, um, and you don't hear it talked about very often. But I think it's something that the government tend to inject in any of their plans to make us all think that it's going to be wonderful and that's something I tend to call hopium <laughs> yeah yeah. <clears throat> that these cats are actually going to change something that uh, a bunch of CEOs and uh, lobbyists aren't controlling <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> you know? we, we fell for it um, a couple of decades ago with some guy called Tony Blair and you know, he he was supposed to be a socialist, but he he basically took the the left of British politics over to the extreme right, and the liberals in the middle ended up being more left than the left wing. It, it was complete rubbish. Yeah, see, and I'm I'm a huge Star Trek fan too, and I, I believe you know I I believe that Gene Roddenberry was tapping into something, and I believe that that is the type of world that we ultimately are going to get to. Mm-hmm. Um, not and people's oh Star Trek is so communist and it's one world government no it's a one world republic uh, if you are really a Star Trek fan, it's a one world republic where the individual's rights are protected okay and that concept would not be there in our consciousness if it's something that is not possible I think we're going to head there and I think it's people like us it's our responsibility to step in that direction. To lay the groundwork for us as humanity to get there, and so one of the necessities is for the old system to be shown for the joke that it is, and so Trump's president over here, and so th- there you go. But you know, I, if you know a lot of over here, we have soap operas like The Young and the Restless and The Bold and the Beautiful, and there are so many housewives. Me growing up around you know housewives that watch that stuff, to them that's the political structure. And after the show's over, they'll get on the phone and talk about what Victor Newman, a fictitious character, did on the show, and it affects their reality. Mm. You know, and I'm sitting here going, it's a show. And so it doesn't affect my reality, and that, so it goes for politics, and that's not just in America. That's all over the world. It's a game show, so just change the channel, change what you pay attention to to something more meaningful. And it's getting to the alternative media over here, and uh, I'll do it because it's the truth. Um, if you actually want to know where you can get good information in the alternative media, there's just one guy that I can really point to, and it's Chuck O'Chelly. Uh, it's it's Chuck Ocelli and the Ocelli effect. Um, he is the only person that I can 100% attest to that isn't sold out, bought out, or or placates to whatever area the wind is blowing. And thank God. And I had that sense about him when I first met him and listened to him, and then it was reconfirmed when he when I actually got to know him in person. Um, he is a real human being. That thinks, 
before he gets on the air and says what he has to say, and he doesn't give a damn what people think. Yeah, and we, we've got this. We've got the same, haven't we? We have Chuck Ortelli on uh, AutonomousMedia.net. and I'm not. He's time. not. Yeah, he's, he's not. Great he's guy. Not, he's not paying me to say any of that crap either. But <laughs> I, you know, uh, I don't even know if he knows I'm on the air right now. But he is. If you honestly want to know what's going on in America, listen to Chuck Ocelli. And he knows for a fact if he ever goes south, I'm the first guy that will say stop listening to Chuck Ocelli. Yeah. Um, but but he's – he's and, and, and it's funny because he gets slighted by even his own network, and it's it's laughable to me because he is the guy that's, that's – and I'm not going to say names here, but he actually had a, a regular guest that was on every single week that was rabidly Trump. Mm-hmm. And you know, and this this took up – an hour or two hours of material a week for his show, and you know Chuck, with his dignity and with his with you know his honor, uh, dismissed this person, and this person's no longer on his show. That's the type of guy I want to listen to in the states. You yes, know, I, l- I listened to that show where Chuck explained his reasons for doing that, and yeah, was, I thought it was um, it was very well said. I mean, Chuck um, basically held the listeners in the palm of his hand for. Straight two hours there, didn't they? Well, look, and and that particular guest came with a large audience. Mm -hmm. So whenever Chuck dismissed this guest, Chuck knowingly was going to lose a massive amount of listeners, and he didn't give a damn. No. He didn't care. You know, so that's the type of stuff that I listen to. You know, the only guy I go to for the news now is Chuck Ocelli. You know, so anybody, if you guys are listening, uh, he's he doesn't do what I do. I don't do what he does. We do in, we do uh, mix together and work together very well. Help that guy out. If you hear people like Chuck or you guys, and we, you hear us say something like, uh, "Go to Patreon and get and support us," do it. Please do it. It's not because you know we're not wealthy. I mean, it literally can mean groceries. For the day or for the week, literally. And so I ask everybody because I know Chuck is, you know, he's legally blind and I've seen him do his show. It is physically painful for the man to do it. Physically painful. He's not supposed to look at a monitor for more than 10 minutes or 40 minutes at a time. He is, he does it well beyond that and suffers migraines more than you can imagine. And he, and he scrapes by. We all do. So if you guys are out there and you get information from genuine voices, please, please don't hesitate and don't assume others are doing it. And if you have a coffee a day or two coffees a day or a soda, can you go without one a day and take that dollar fifty, dollar seventy five, whatever it is, and put it to where it's really going to make a difference in the world? I mean, it's not that difficult. And so you'll see people like Chuck come to the forefront if people do that, you know. So, yeah, sorry, I, I, I didn't really need to be a commercial for that. Chuck Ocelli, but <laughs> well, and yeah, we get paid exactly the same off Chuck as you do. So you know, the, we're we're not making anything out of um, putting Chuck's show out, but we rebroadcast it five nights a week. What we do, we broadcast the previous show because it goes out at kind of one o'clock in the morning our time. And, a lot of the listeners aren't around for that, so we put it out 5 p.m. the next evening, and uh, it just gets a, a, a few more people listening to it. So, um, yeah, fantastic. So, yeah, you guys go go and help him out um, for real. He he he's the real deal. He, he's real, and he and he deserves it. Mm. You know, and he's got a, and he's got a kid. He's got a wonderful family, and he's a great dad. And and so. Uh, any, anything that could take uh, worry and alleviation off of his mind and if, if there's going to be food in the house or lights on so that he could be a full-time dad, man, help the dude out, for real. It'll come back to you a hundredfold. <laughs> well, we, um, we, we've we got about ten minutes left, so um, I think we're, we're at this stage where we need to start wrapping up. So uh, I just want you to give some links out and some... some um, Places where people can uh, read stuff that uh, you've done and, and stuff that you've uh, published. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, g- g- uh, the, we'll give you the floor for the last ten minutes. Well, for the last, should we say seven minutes? About seven minutes, yeah. Yeah, we've got Sounds a tune. Like a to, we've got a four-minute tune to play out. So if you can take. Oh, us right, six minutes that. then. Last yeah. six minutes. Cool. I could do that. Um, 
Yeah, first and foremost, man, um, well, you can find you know my my home base is downloadedcontent.com. It's easy to remember because my initials are DLC, and so is the site. Um, first and foremost, buy my novel. Uh, buy it on the you know get an ebook or a hardback or a paperback. Um, it's called Then Came the Flood. Uh, I urge you to read the first three chapters, you know, so you know what you're purchasing. Um, if, if you want a really good uh, action adventure, dramatic look into the antediluvian world, uh, I, everybody who's ever read it said if there's ever a book that needs to be turned into a movie, it's that. Uh, so please purchase Then Came the Flood. You can get that at the website, downloadedcontent.com. Um, Amazon.com, Barnes and Nobles, all your major book retailers. Um, the podcast is on, you know, like I said, Google Play. It's on Stitcher, iTunes. It's all out there, and the website. You can download it there directly. Um, the serial novel that I'm writing right now for free is on DownloadedContent.com. Just look on the sidebar and start at Prologue. Uh, in at the bottom, you'll see click here for the next chapter and just follow along. Um, you can also go to YouTube. And uh, it's the downloaded content. It's all separate words. The channel and subscribe there. Um, now on my my main my main site, there's a contact page. Um, you just type your message in there. I'm very approachable. You know, I work from home. Uh, if you want to contact me directly, or you know, if anybody out there who's in the media that wants to book me for an interview or whatnot, just go right there. Send. You know, I try to get back to everybody as quick as I can. Uh, I, I'm I'm on Facebook mostly. Just send me a friend request, uh, Daniel Lewis Crumpton on Facebook, and private message me, and uh, or you could send me a, a Skype request, uh, Daniel Lewis Crumpton. Just put in the message whenever you send where you heard me and uh, what you'd like to talk about. And like I said, I'm real approachable, and I do do private. Uh, some people ask me to do readings or sessions. I don't. I don't call myself a life coach. <laughs> I say I'm an afterlife coach. <laughs> you know. So, uh, but I have people from all over who either want me to do tarot readings for them or uh, channel for them uh, or, or uh, you know, any type of metaphysical explanation. People from all over come to me. So, uh, yeah, if, if you want to contact me that way. But I would say to, to really get a, a good idea of who I am and what I do, go to downloadedcontent.com, and, and that's where I'm at. That's brilliant. Thanks for that, Daniel. You've been a great guest tonight. I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. And uh, I do hope you'll come on again in the future, have a chat with us. Um, I'd, like yeah, thank, I'd like to thank yeah. everyone for listening tonight. Um, we, we really do appreciate your support. And uh, we'll be back the same time next week when we've got uh, who I believe has been our most popular guest to date making his return. <laughs> we've got the one and only Chris Bibby. So... It'll be something like, different next week. We can guarantee that. One last thing, guys. Uh, mm -hmm. For you guys listening, if you would, go to patreon.com forward slash DLC. And if you want to be a patron uh, with, with the podcast, uh, I would really appreciate that. But, man, I've had a blast, guys. Thanks for having me on, man. Any time in the future sounds fun to me. That's fabulous. Thanks for that. Um, we, yeah, it's we, been great. It's been really good talking to you tonight. It's been uh, Superb. I think we've got a, a, quite a lot in common and uh, quite a lot of the same ideas. Good. And I love it when I meet like-minded people. Yeah, thanks to all the great contributions from the chat room. Um, just a, a quick word before we go. Um, we had a little conversation with Andy Mackey earlier in the day, and uh, I think it was show 104 that was uh, we had Andy on, and uh, it was a very passionate couple of hours that... Now, Andy did put out an appeal there for some help of anyone who can do any video editing. He's got masses of information um, showing the depth and breadth of the corruption of police and solicitors. And he needs some help to put that together because it's some pretty mind-blowing evidence. So if anyone's available to, to help Andy, please get in touch with me. Uh, Andy, yeah, and, and, Andy, uh, sorry. Uh, Andy, Andy suffers from uh, dyslexia. He's he's dyslexic, so it's difficult for him to read and write and do stuff like that. Yeah. So this is this is the reason. It's not you don't need to be like a, a genius and mathematic. Just somebody who can perhaps just give him some time and 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 get it. Tell him to get tell him to get a hold of me, guys. We'll do, Daniel. We'll, we'll do that. Then. Really appreciate the offer, man. We'll put him in touch with you. 
So uh, we're, we're just getting ready to say goodnight. Like I say, we've got Chris Spivey next week, so I don't miss that one. It'll be something pretty special. Last time, I know it, <laughs> it really <laughs> was. Um, we've got uh, Not Dr. Tamara and Tina coming up uh, in just a few moments with Happy Hour. And tonight's all about homeschooling. Uh, so I think there'll be some interesting uh, revelations there from Tamara because she's, she's really... Uh, Busy with that herself, um, homeschooling three under five. So uh, I'm, I'm going to listen to that with great interest. Uh, thanks for listening again, everyone. And we're going to play out with this special one for Jason. And just so you all know at home, I'm wearing my pink feathery hat for this one. Good night, all. <laughs>